Okay. So good morning. Thank you for bringing the elements to be here. Um, so this is Beyond Student Evaluations of Teaching, Term Faculty Perspective. And um, I'm Lauren Weiss from the Department of Philosophy and Religion, and I'm the Director of the Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies Program, and uh, all the College of Arts and Sciences. And I'm here um, representing both the Senate Term Faculty Committee, which I've just joined, um, along with um, Robert, who's going to introduce themselves. And I also serve on the College of Arts and Sciences Term Faculty Task Force. Bob Cecina from CoGuide, and as was mentioned by Lauren, I'm on the Term Faculty Committee, brand new member. And I'm Robert Kelly, I'm um, Assistant Professor at SIS, and uh, also a um, member of this Term Faculty Committee, which I, which I happen to chair now. Um, just so you have an understanding of what that is, um, this is a committee that was um, launched um, in, this, in the winter of 2012, January 2012, um, as a means to properly implement policies that had been uh, reshaped, introduced into the latest iteration of the faculty manual. So it was our job um, on an ad hoc basis um, with as broad representation as we could muster to try to, to try to make sure that those were implemented properly and if there were any inconsistencies in the language that we worked out those inconsistencies in cooperation with the Executive Committee and the Senate and the DAA. So um, where this committee is going now is that it seems to be uh, evolving into a, a, a more of an advocacy-like body, um, which I think is a good thing, and I think all of us uh, agree that this sort of advocacy is necessary. We've seen the adjunct faculty organize and develop their own voice, which has been um, an important step for them. And in the middle here is us, uh, term faculty with um, a very large representation on campus, a growing representation continually, and, um, and what kind of voice does this group have in the university and how, how will we get our interests um, heard and, 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 and uh, represented. Um, and so this issue of SETs is important because it so happens that term faculty's performance is evaluated in large part on the data that is generated by students on these uh, student evaluations of teaching. And so I think what we're going to talk about today is um, not only um, you know, where things stand with the SET as a tool of measuring evaluation um, and how the academic units interpret that data and utilize that data, but as the name implies, going beyond that. How, how do we diversify um, the data points that we collect when we evaluate um, teaching, especially for term faculty? Um, and I'll certainly be sharing some of my perspectives from SIS, and um, in this panel here we've got other representation from other units. Um, my proposal here is just if we could maybe take, uh, how much time do we have until 10.30? Is that? 10.15. Is that 10 until 10.15. Um, maybe take maybe 10 minutes per person? Um, also, I think it would be, since we have a small group here, and yeah. I see a number of our yeah. committee members yeah. here, yeah. people could introduce themselves. Yeah, yeah, sure. We can, we, we can do that, but I mean, just as a, as a, as a point of order, um, to share, share our thoughts in, in kind of sequence and then, and then open it up for, for everybody else to ask questions and share ideas. Um, but taking on your, uh, your recommendation, if we could get, get introductions around the room. Okay, yeah. I'm Ralph Sunshine. Um, I'm in the Department of Economics in my fifth year as a uh, term faculty member. Very interested in this subject. And I also serve on the uh, term faculty committee. Uh, I started doing that in the fall. And this is the CAS one? Yes. Right, right, yes. Which, which has to be distinguished. You're on the Senate. Yeah. There's, right. a, there's yeah. a university level, and then there's a CAS level. Right, and I, I actually, I've, I've felt in the dark about so much, mm. and these kind of things have shed some light. Mm. Not enough, but a, a lot of <laughs> things. Don't feel badly. I've been term faculty for 12 years. I didn't know there was a Senate committee until I went on it. So. Right, right. <laughs> mm -hmm. Evan Kraft, also in the economics department, and it's my third year as term faculty. And I'm a little bit less in the dark from talking to Ralph, but um, <laughs> now I'm pretty in the dark, so I'm hoping you find some place. I'll stay over here, Jeff. Okay. Uh, Jeff Sosland, I'm also on the uh, committee. I'm with the SPECS, the School for Professional Extended Studies. I've been term faculty for about 11 years. Um, <coughs> <laughs> Jeff is on the oh, university yeah. committee. Yeah. Uh, Corinne Horn, School of Communication, Public Communication Division. Uh, been second year and also serving on the university. Thank you, Corinne. 
I'm Mohamed Ala, um, also from practicing in science. I'm Adrian Pearson from the Art Department. I teach art history. I'm Villanova from World Languages and Cultures. I serve in the third faculty task force from CIS, and that task force was uh, launched last year um, as part of the Lean Advisory Committee in CIS. When, after the survey, they realized that there was need, a need to just focus on term faculty issues, and we produced and this is like publicity just <laughs> we produced a report last year uh, last spring with a recommendation from faculty at the CIS level but I think it went beyond um, CIS level and it went across the area as well you know, somehow. So I'm part of that task force. I'm Jacqueline from the Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm um, Chris Touch from biology, uh, term faculty. Um, this is my end of my 14th year uh, teaching here. I'm also on the CIS uh, term faculty task force, <coughs> and I'm also the chair of vice for the dean's advisory committee um, in CIS as one of the term faculty. Um, Lacey Wooden. I am. This is my 15th year as a term faculty member. I'm in the Department of Literature. Um, and I was on the previous iteration of the university term faculty committee, which was back in 2009, and then the second version of it up and through up through last year. And um, I'm currently serving as vice chair of the faculty senate. Had some newcomers into the room, so if you could take a second and introduce yourselves. Uh, sure, Thomas Nissi from Term Faculty and School of Education. I got concerned for a second. <laughs> Not at all. We're just getting started. <laughs> all right. Um, so, Lauren, would you like to kick things off with? Sure. Um, so, I, I hope I have made enough copies. Um, <coughs> so we have extras up here. Um, this handout that's gone around is a um, highlight summary of a report um, that's been published from the Center for Teaching, Research, and Learning um, in the summer of 2013 called Report on Our Beyond Student Evaluation of Teaching Project. Um, so this is just some, some highlights that I thought would be relevant for our conversation. So does anybody need an extra copy? I have one as well. Yeah. Um, so, and actually, I'd like to recognize Chris Tudge, my fellow traveler on many committees. Um, he's been doing a lot of work on this for our Trump Faculty Task Force. Um, and one of the things that I thought was most relevant and interesting about this report is that CTRL decided to focus exclusively on tenure line faculty in their, their research on university practices and policies related to the use of student evaluation of teaching or faculty evaluation. Um, so they throw in some references here and there to, oh yes, this should probably apply to term faculty and to adjunct faculty as well, mm -hmm. but there's been no widespread study of the use of student evaluation and teaching. And um, one of the things that I thought was interesting is they, they asked a lot of questions about how various units were using sets in the um, both the rank and tenure process and the merit review process. And I thought it would have been fairly straightforward and simple for them to slip in an additional question in their survey um, as to, you know, do these policies apply to term faculty? Do these policies apply to adjunct faculty? But they didn't. So I thought that, that was an interesting um, oversight, perhaps, on their part, <coughs> especially in light of the fact that about student evaluations of teaching are so important for term faculty members because term faculty do so much teaching. Um, so a couple things to highlight here. Um, there is concern at the university level that perhaps there's too much emphasis on student evaluations of teaching as a sole means to evaluate teaching. Um, not only that faculty members don't understand how sets are being used in the evaluation process, but also that it may not reflect best practices um, in academia. 
to rely solely on student evaluations of teaching as an evaluation measure. Um, the other thing that there's some emphasis on here that we've also been working on in the College of Arts and Sciences that I think relates to STEM is the question of faculty mentoring. So there's a lot of focus in the CTRL report <coughs> on the idea that mentoring, collegial faculty mentoring, could be a powerful tool in improving, the, the phrase they use is pedagogical excellence at the university level. Um, and one thing that they note in their um, recommendation is that CTRL has a service that they offer whereby faculty members whose, whose sets and whose evaluations aren't meeting the bar that each school has set, the teaching units can refer those faculty to CTRL for um, professional development related to teaching. <coughs> but the CTRL is kind of overwhelmed at this point with referrals, <laughs> and they're trying to push some of that back to the unit level. Now, the one thing that they don't mention or clarify in the report is, who are the people being referred? The report focuses on tenure line faculty members, but um, I would presume, correctly or incorrectly, that it's not only tenure line faculty members who are being referred to CTRL <coughs> for this kind of um, uh, professional development. Um, in fact, I know personally of several cases in the College of Arts and Sciences of new term faculty members, first year term faculty members, who were tentatively, whose contract renewals were tentatively den denied simply on the basis of their set scores and their units pushed back and they were allowed a little bit of leeway but were required to go through a um, uh, unit designed but approved by the college plan for teaching improvement, some of which involve referral to CTA. Um, one thing, I have an experience where I had, for a midterm evaluation, my department chair, especially dean, recommended I just, not because my set scores were low, per se, but because I see Marilyn Goldhammer at CTRL, and she was wonderful. I, I had no idea how much feedback she would give me on my syllabus and she observed my classes, and then we talked about it, and, um, <clears throat> and it was a really powerful tool for me, and <clears throat> you know, that school of education can help me at Maryland Goldhammer, but it would be nice if each department had their own CTRL contact that could be, could circulate around faculty mm -hmm. and the different classes. The system the library has, for yeah, example. Yeah, so Koga so has Michael Mathos. It's sort of our go to so first. You have, you have somebody for, and I, I, I mean, not one for all college arts and science, mm -hmm. yeah, for each department and school, but it was very helpful for me. Um, and I've taught for many years, that, and uh, there's just a lot of knowledge there. This is actually one of the recommendations from um, you know, in Maryland's report. Um, so I think uh, following from the fact that the, the CTRL is sort of overwhelmed with requests from units. They recommend that academic units should be encouraged to create mechanisms for mentoring pedagogical excellence at the teaching unit level. But they also um, say that they'll explore the possibility of creating a university-wide cadre of faculty mentors to presumably focus primarily on pedagogy. Um, and, and there were four kind of themes that they mentioned in an appendix to the report that I thought were interesting that point to best practices at other institutions. So the one is the overall mentoring of faculty. Um, and we've been doing a lot of study of this in college arts and sciences, both in the term faculty task force and in the dean's advisory committee. Um, and one of the schools that they mention is the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, um, which is a program that, that I've done some research on. And they <coughs> have won um, $400,000 grant um, from the Mellon Foundation to um, develop programs for faculty mentoring. So they point to that program in particular as a kind of standout mentoring program. Um, they also mention peer observation, the development of faculty teaching portfolios, and reflective ways to interpret student evaluation feedback. And one of the questions, sort of overall questions in the report is what, at the university level, so through the Faculty Senate, for example, what should we as a university be um, encouraging? What sort of practices? And then the, the big question is then, 
are these practices that should be encouraged as voluntary, or are they practices that should be re required? So for example, they point to the development of faculty teaching por portfolios. How should they be used? Um, and if the university is going to encourage certain practices around peer evaluation and the development of teaching portfolios, it's essential, according to the recommendations, that the university step up resources to make that happen, um, which I think is a really big issue mm -hmm. on this campus. Um, I'm sure that there will be more that I can talk about from CIS once we get into discussion. But okay. Um, I'm, I'm a great believer that where you stand in life depends on where you sit. So let me tell you kind of where I've sat most of my career in a sentence or two. I'm fundamentally a finance guy and I'm a numbers guy. Um, so my last job with, um, was with American Express and I ran Latin America for the company. Um, and so the first thing I would mention that isn't necessarily widely known is that because uh, term faculty are paid very roughly two-thirds of what tenure line faculty are paid and we're about 50 percent higher teaching load in terms of revenue generation and we're not an endowed university 95 percent of our revenue comes from tuition we are twice as productive so that says the research done I mean, some of us do research I, I don't and the research community is very grateful that I don't uh, <laughs> um, but, but uh, that puts, I mean, research has got to be highly valuable to say that you can afford tenure line faculty. So if this place ever got into financial trouble, I tell you what I do is freeze every tenure line faculty higher in the place and replace them with term faculty. Um, so that, that's sort of a starting point. Secondly, let me, let me run through the COGOD process because it is it works very hard to be objective about a process that I at the end of the day is going to have some substantive piece of subjectivity to it. Um, our merit performance evaluation process begins with FARS. So if you don't have your input done in the faculty activity reporting system by January 31st, no matter whether you're tenured, untenured, full professor, you are ineligible for a merit increase. Um, so that's for starters. Um, then we basically divide, um, oh, and, and that input goes to the department chair, and the evaluation process is done by the executive committee of the school, which includes key um, staff members, as well as the department chairs, and of course the dean. <coughs> And um, the process for merit reviews is there's one pool and it's level playing field, whether you're a full professor or you're exec in residence and whether you're, you're uh, your first year or your 12th year, the criteria is the same. Um, we use a four point evaluation scale and we, we divide in between teaching and service, 75% uh, teaching, 25% service. And we've just started a new process, I haven't engaged in it personally yet, but I plan to, where you can negotiate with your department chair to change that 75-25. So in my own case, for example, I'm teaching somewhat less and doing a lot more in service. So I'm going to negotiate for 60-40 split. Mm -hmm. I'll probably start 50-50 and let them pull me mm -hmm. to 60. You know, it's like buying a car, kind of thing. We just talked about that. Thing. Um, so, uh, you know, four-point scale that ranges from needs improvement to excellent. Um, teaching, SETs are a part, but only a part. We start off with what your teaching load is. So, not just the number of courses, but we look at the number of preps, and we look at the number of students that you taught. So, it's a very quantitative, revenue-oriented, <laughs> keep coming back to that word, we are a business school, so you've got to mm -hmm. take that into account. Uh, the SATs, SETs are a part of that, uh, and everybody is compared against the COGI average, which is, uh, when I found out what it was, I was surprisingly a bit on the high side, higher than I thought. It's 6.04% uh, uh, or 6.04 on the seven-point scale. Uh, and so, yeah, I didn't think we had that many good. 
So, so to get above the 6.04 is a bit of a, um, you, you know, you got to do some work. You got to be pretty good. So, so that's the teaching piece. <coughs> I don't have, unfortunately, I don't have available with me the split as to what the relative importance of all of those things are. But I do know that folks that are struggling, uh, whether they're term faculty or not, are assigned mentors and and are help uh, to to improve. And um, one of the curious things, by the way, that happens in academia, I, <laughs> being a business guy, I sometimes um, find things puzzling. But um, if people are unproductive in research, they're actually assigned a higher teaching load. Why would you do that? I mean, seriously. Figure out a way to make them more productive in research or do something with them. But I think that's university wide Yeah? yeah. I, you know, basically that foists them onto our students, which I, I regard our students not as customers. Uh, customers is sort of a retail <coughs> term. The customer's always right, and rule two is there is no rule two. We'll go back to rule one, the customer's always right. Mm -hmm. But clients are different from customers, and I believe our students are clients. And the client is sometimes wrong, and it's our obligation to tell them. So I've done a lot of consulting work, and I consider it my professional obligation to look a client in the eye and say, that's not right. Let me give you the benefit of my best <coughs> thinking on the subject, and, uh, which is always a polite way of saying you're out of your mind. But um, And the service comes, uh, the 25% comes right off of the FARS report and that you know that can range from everything like be sure that this year's FARS for me is going to say that I was on this panel okay to serving on the term faculty committee to bringing in external guest speakers as a laundry list how you then evaluate that how this committee evaluates that is very subjective. I mean, the more items you got in the list, if you can make it three pages long, cool. That's got to be helpful. But but also, I think it, it, you know, the folks on that committee have a sense of what your general reputation is in the place. Are, are you a go-to person? Uh, are you the kind of person who sort of never says no? Um, and that impacts where you come out in service. We have annual awards. So we, uh, and it's the same criteria for term faculty as it is for tenure faculty. So you can get an award that has cash associated with it. It's like a thousand, I think each one is a thousand dollars. And you can be awarded both. You can be awarded, if you're a four four, you would get both an award for teaching and an award for service. Uh, if you're not a four in teaching, but you're a four in service, you get a thousand dollars for service. In fact, we may have raised it to 1500 with inflation being what it is. So that's our process. And Lauren and I were talking uh, earlier uh, about, you know, I, I believe a process like that could work across the university and that I don't see any reason why department chairs would be allowed to have their own idiosyncratic fiefdoms in this regard. And Lauren was arguing a bit, I don't want to put words in her mouth, that there, there would be a need for variations, and I, I mentioned, you know, at the risk of sounding a bit arrogant, I, I ran a bank with um, 3,000 people in 33 countries around the world, uh, from France to Germany, where we were unionized, to India, to you name it. We used the exact same process in every country around the world, including staff in New York, uh, including me, including my boss, including the CEO of. American Express. I'll stop there. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Uh, sure. Does everybody in COGOD know this, what, what you just said? Yeah, because every, oh, I'm sorry. Every, uh, when you're told what your increase is, you get an in writing evaluation from your department chair that specifically mentions all these criteria and how you stacked up. So you can't not know. And verbal too, or just in writing? If you want to. Uh, you, you know, that's a little idiosyncratic. Some department chairs don't like to sit and look face to face and say, hey, you're really kind of a bum, you know. You but, but you could. You could get that letter and request a meeting with your department chair 
and they the letter specifically says they're available to do that. See, that's a key link because you don't always know what good is. Yeah. You know, and you yeah, think and good it's a relative term. Is, you know, both in the set and your service. How do you know what good is? Yeah. Gee, I want to That's the good. one that's probably most, I would say, subjective <coughs> is the service piece. Um, but but you know, the awards are also presented publicly in the first council meeting we have the beginning of the semester, the dean stands up there and makes the announcement name by name and hands out a certificate um, and, and you know, a payment comes into your next pay statement. So everybody knows who gets what and I tell you from my own experience, there are very, very, very few surprises when people get their awards. I mean, you know who the top teachers are in, in COVID and, and who, who's sort of carrying more than their own <coughs> Uh, level of water, you know, above average in terms of service. Thanks, Bob. Yep. Um, okay, so <coughs> what I'm going to talk about is a little bit um, uh, the the the, out, the outcome of my kind of deep deep thinking onto this subject of SETs and also the process as it as it takes place in SIS, uh, where I am. Um, the, f the first question that I want to start with is, is you know, if there's, if there's so much disillusionment with SETs, why do we have them? Why do we use them? And the crude answer is twofold. One is, of course, to evaluate the teaching performance of instructors. And the other side of this is the student experience, because a lot of these questions are molded around how students are experiencing the class. Are you challenged? Are you satisfied? Would you take another course like this again? You know, so these are all you know, temperature checks of our clients to see how they're enjoying their flight. Right? <laughs> um, and, uh, and that's not bad. I mean, that's quite useful, actually. This is an instrument that's deployed university-wide, and we get a sense of how students are enjoying their collegiate experience. The trouble, of course, is that we're pairing experience with performance. We're taking experience and we're extrapolating from that something about the teaching performance. And we've got some flaws with that, right? Uh, for instance, um, self-reports have limits because students, I mean, if anyone does, um, you know, this as a survey methodology, you know very well that self-reports um, will, will just give you a, a limited picture of what that person is experiencing at a given moment. And, um, and of course, our, our, our chief problem with self-reports, mo most of all, is that people don't really know what they know. Um, they, they, they tend to over, over, overstate or understate or be uh, momentarily paralyzed by the information around them and report on what it is that they see at a given moment. Students can be bought. They will readily admit this, right? Um, several years ago, the university had a small fund that teachers could avail themselves of at SET time most conveniently to pay for pizza. And when we did this, the SETs experienced a little bump. No surprises there, right? Um, so students can be bought. They can also be sometimes bought with, with good grades, right? Um, that if a, if a professor uh, looks upon them kindly in the evaluation department, then a student will respond favorably on the SET. Boy, that professor was lenient with me, right? Therefore, I had a good experience in the course, to say nothing about what I learned. And so this is probably the biggest drawback, right, is, is that it doesn't say anything about student performance. Um, what they learned, uh, where they were at the beginning of the course to where they were at the end, um, SETs tell us absolutely nothing about that. And so we don't know what, what they've come away learning, and, and the teacher can be a, a hard ass and teach the students a lot, and there's no recognition of that, but of course they get penalized for being a hard ass. I think we all know individuals who suffer that kind of fate. Um, now, on the back end, when this data gets generated by students, the interpreters of this data, and I'm speaking from an SIS perspective, are looking for a scant few data points. I mean, there are a number of questions on the SET, I don't know, 20-something. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you um, from experience and, and with, with utmost certainty, 100% certainty, that, that SI SIS is really only looking for three or four. Right. Uh, Reinforce that at CODA. Yeah, faster. yeah. And, um, and, and so, um, you know, the specific questions they're looking at are, number five, are you being challenged? 
in the classroom. Number six, overall, how satisfied are you with the instructor? And number 16, overall, how satisfied are you with the course? Same three. That's it, right? right? They might as well just dis dis administer an SET with those three questions because that's really all that matters. The rest of the stuff could be stuff. thrown out the window, <laughs> right? And that's really unfortunate, all that effort. Um, you know, like when, when, you, when you narrow it all down, those three questions factor disproportionately heavily into the whatever it is that the academic unit adopts as their factor for teaching evaluation. At SIS, it can be somewhere in the neighborhood of 90%. In Kogab, we've heard 75%. And in, and in other units, that number is probably somewhere in that ballpark of, of 75 to 85, 90%. CAS standard for term faculty is 80 You're right, right. So 80% at CAS. Um, this, so so when, you, when, you, when you carve away all the, 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 the static and get to, okay, what inputs give us our output? It's really three questions that give us a factor that, uh, that, 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 that measures 80, you know, 75 to 90% of your performance and will determine what your contract status is as a term faculty member. That's it. Now, if, if, if people aren't outraged by that, they should be. And one of, the, one of the, the things that I see myself doing in this position as chair of the ad hoc term faculty committee is to stoke that kind of outrage that this is unacceptable. Because <coughs> I, 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 I don't think it's, it, it's right that, that that's what it's reduced <coughs> to. So the, the other side of this then, the flip side now, uh, looking on the positive side, is to go beyond, as the title suggests. So how can we create more touch points, right? To borrow a term from business, right? And to, to touch points, how do, we, how do we touch our clients in ways that they like, you know? Um, and, uh, and, and multiply, right? Like, get more data, triangulate, right? So we have SET, which tells us what students think about the class. That's great. We have 100% Depend, dependence on that data for your, your, your renewal. Now what about um, performance? You know, how, how do we get at student performance? Well, in SIS, I, t I, I coordinate a course called Cross-Cultural Communication. It's the largest undergraduate course on offer at SIS. Every student who walks through that door has to take it. And what I have done is I've deployed a student survey of learning. We've piloted it now for a couple of years and it has 24 questions at the beginning of the term. Students will take the survey and it measures how much they know about the course content at the front end. They take the same exact survey again at the back end. And the differential is the learning, right? Just like the movie Smoke, right? We smoke the cigar, the ashes go, the difference is the weight of the smoke, right? So that's where we are. It's the, it's the, that's the difference. And, um, and uh, pre it's a pre and post test. So over time, we are measuring student learning on a set of questions. They do not change. And all of these questions are in some way linked to one of the learning outcomes of the course. Measurable, right? So we've got six in SIS altogether. The only ones that I felt like I could measure with the survey tool were four, the first four. And, and all of those questions are connected in some way. So we're able to not only see change in the aggregate from, you know, for, for survey scores, that's from start to finish, but also break it down into isolated course learning objectives and see which learning objectives are we excelling and which ones are we not. All the way down to the, to, to the section to the instructor and then I can deliver that information to the instructor and say, here's where you have been strong in your teaching of your students and here's where you have been weak. And, and, the, and the differences are clear for everybody to see. I showed it at a workshop with my faculty and everybody was like, wow, this is really useful. Now I see where I stand in relation to the other instructors in this course. How do I get better at what I'm weak at? And we had a, we had a very transparent conversation about that. Um, so that's one method of measuring student performance that we're piloting at SIS and cross-cultural communication. Um, so, but, but there are, I mean, obviously there are lots of challenges at, 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 at trying, to, um, trying to, to complete the triangulation because the SET is a university-wide tool. Um, is there a way to come up with a comparable tool that can be rolled out university-wide in this way that does the job of measuring student performance and can provide everybody with that additional data point? Or do we have to go down to the unit level, even the course level, and come up with customized ways 
um, of, of measuring performance. Um, that, that, is, that is a question that I think a, that the folks in this room can consider, um, but I think in general it's in our best interest to find a way to go beyond the, the tool of evaluating teacher performance in the way that we do now and come up with a, with a broader set of, of data points. I think I'd also like to heartily um, endorse what's being done in COGOD, and, I, and I've told other people about Bob's experience in COGOD. The level of transparency and the criteria in the merit review process and, and what exactly constitutes good teaching, um, it's not just the SETs, it's also the level, you know, the number of students, the number of sections, the number of, you know, this is the sort of transparency that I think outstrips uh, my, 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 my assumption would be all other section, all other academic units, especially SIS, where we are actually becoming more opaque. You're in making a, a very good point in, in, our, in our merit process. I think the transparency is in fact more important than the process. Yeah. Truly. Yeah. You, you could make the process worse than ours or better or whatever. The transparency is the key. Yeah. 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 Anyway, sorry. Our system in CIS is a bit different, mm -hmm. and um, transparency has been a real problem. So last year, the CIS Dean's Advisory Committee did a study on the merit process, not only of our internal merit processes, but of best practices in merit evaluation in other universities. And the committee held a town hall meeting, and um, the dean presented to faculty the uh, evaluation system that's, that's used at the college level once data from the individual teaching units are reported to the college. And I heard tenured, very experienced faculty members say that they were completely unfamiliar with this process that had supposedly been used to evaluate them for years on end. Um, that there were particular um, scores and I, I ever heard a guy in the history department who's been in AU for 10 years say, I've never even heard of that before. Mm -hmm. So I think transparency is a big issue. Um, I completely appreciate that emphasis on transparency. Um, but I also have some, some concerns about um, what, what kinds of developments and innovations might be squelched by such an emphasis on capturing certain data points. Um, so for example, one of the things that we've been talking about in the College of Arts and Sciences is courses that are being cut or eliminated due to strict emphasis on enrollment counts mm -hmm. and how that can create um, huge problems for units that are trying to develop and launch new programs. Mm -hmm. um, so I wonder, you know, how do we capture a measure of pedagogical competence or excellence for a new course that's never been taught before? Um, for a course that maybe the learning objectives need to be clarified, you know, over a couple of semesters. Um, so I do think that there is some um, demand for what we've been calling kind of unit level autonomy, teaching unit level autonomy in the merit process, but I also think that there's a real need to balance that with transparency. I, I would, you know, as somebody who's invented, quite literally, I don't know, probably eight or ten courses in my time here, um, it is more or less a thankless task. It's a, it's a high-risk endeavor. We haven't mentioned this yet, but we get paid, execs and residents get paid to put butts in seats. And if you don't put butts in seats, you, you know, forget about it. So if you don't have 15 students in a classroom, your class is looked at with great scrutiny to be canceled or not. And right now I'm in the happy set of circumstances where all of my teaching load but one course is met by courses that I invented. But boy, I struggled for years to get those classes full. Um, I, I mean, I did everything short of walking around the quad wearing sandwich boards, mm -hmm. saying, you know, sort of like eat at Joe's, come to Bob's class. And, um, you know, I'm now privileged of two courses I'm teaching this semester. Um, two thirds of the class are non-COGOT students. 
their SISers principally and some CAS. Yeah, sir. Um, can, can, we, can we maybe clarify a couple points that I think got muddy in here? Um, first of all, I think most term faculty are more concerned with reappointment than merit. Um, you know, merit matters, but what we really care about is keeping our jobs, right? And so those processes, I think, tend to be even more opaque and muddy and unclear and blurry than probably the merit processes do. Um, so I think that's one thing to, you know, to kind of keep in mind is really what we care about is real because um, the merit money is for up uh, for places other than Kogod apparently is pretty <laughs> significantly. Small. Well, I didn't say the money was big. Um, yeah. The process. So that's that thousand dollars a heck. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That that was, a um, point. yeah. Um, the other thing I think that is important to kind of keep clear, and I think that the the CTRL report muddies this too, is the distinction between mentoring and evaluating. Um, I think that it's quite easy for a unit to call something mentoring when in reality what they're doing is evaluating. And mm -hmm. it's, like it's crucial that as we think about these things at the unit level that they need to be pulled apart. Um, and I think one of the places that shows up the most is unfortunately the getting sent to CTRL thing instead of being a mentoring move has started to come across as a punishment move. Mm -hmm. You know, you're bad, so you get sent to CTRL. You know, CTRL is <laughs> not wild about this perception either. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah it, it exists, right? And that's a problem. And I think that's I think that's indicative of this blurring between mentoring and evaluation. Um, the other thing too, I think, is important to keep in mind, and this goes to Robert, your point about um, outrage. The faculty manual says that no personnel decisions can be made on the basis of evaluations. It's Units are repeatedly in flagrant violation of the faculty manual policy. Um, mm -hmm. And I think they There's disguise no. it in a variety of ways. Yes, read your faculty manual, do that. Um, that's you know, homework after this. Everybody should read it. Um, wow. You can't, um, yeah, you can't, they can't do it, and yes, they do. Um, and just if I can take a minute to talk about the Senate angle on the CTRL report, because um, I think it kind of adds to what you're talking about. Um, Naomi came to a Senate meeting. Um, um, last fall and presented this report. Um, there was an extended discussion in the Senate of it, um, very substantive discussion. People talked a lot about the idea of learning outcomes. If we can measure learning outcomes, how might we do that? Um, there was a lot of talk about how we can better evaluate teaching in general, a lot of concern about the SETs. And then at the close of it, the provost asked, his, his sort of take on it was, we need a committee to devise a new form. New a form. new SDT form. That was where he ended up. Um, so what's going to happen is um, CTRL has put together a bunch of research for us that we're really eager to get to see that has about what other schools are doing in terms of evaluating teaching. There's going to be a Senate committee that will look at devising a new form. However, people on the Senate want it to be much more than that. Um, want it to be not just devising a new form, but looking at these other measurements of teaching um, how we can offer guidance to units and requirements to units while allowing for unit autonomy. So that committee is going to get started this spring and it will be looking at creating a new SET form but also how can we measure teaching in other ways. Um, so there's movement at the university level um, <coughs> that I'm hopeful about. I mean I really want, I would really like to be on that Senate committee. Um, to work on this to make sure we have term faculty representation on it. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just a couple of things. I think we have a kind of question here that goes beyond the SEDs and is that conception that we have about education and clients and then, you know, if you have clients, to my understanding, you have clients and then you have the problem mm -hmm. with what happens with the SEDs and so on. But I don't think we should go that way now because we could have no, I come from another kind of avenue and I would like to have that discussion sometime, but not now. Mm -hmm. The reason that I think we had this panel with SETs specifically for term faculty is because there are certain specificities that um, are more, you know, for, are different for term faculty and for tenure, or I just that for sure. And I would like to find that those, some of them have already been mentioned, but there is one that is still in my mind that I would like to ask. Well, first of all, is the fact that we teach, we have a, you know, a fluid teaching world, so a higher one, or a higher one, and three and three, really. Also, um, 
we don't generally now service and research can be accounted in the many, you know, uh, review, but that's that is still very new, as you say, it's not kind of, you know, okay, 50% or 20%, this is still not well established. It depends on the teaching units and it's still kind of there. The third point, and that's the one we haven't touched yet, is what kind of courses the faculty teach. Because not everybody is teaching the upper level courses that you design. I mean, I am so happy that probably teaches both, and that's why I feel I can talk about this, because I teach a gen ed that I have been teaching since I arrived. Probably it's American, you know, so it's both American history, I'm not sure, but at the same time, I teach upper level, graduate level classes that I design myself. And always, I mean, I've been here for five years, that class gets a higher. Um, as it came. Why? Because students take it because they want to take it. So the first, you know, the first approach to it is positive. When they have to do, you know, like calculus or maths or college writing, college writing, <laughs> or writing <laughs> you know, language at the very elementary level as a requirement for SIS or, you know, in our department, that's a different animal altogether, you know. So I was in the um, chairs meeting because I'm associate chair of my department right now. And uh, you were there, Lauren, as well, when the, they presented the mid, um, mid states, uh, mid, 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 yeah, mid mm -hmm. states draft that is going to be come just, just you know the final version these days. And they were saying, you know, we are we are pleased to announce that we still ten faculty have a better average in terms of their SETs across AU. Mm -hmm. And of course, this is numeric. This is something you can measure. But what's behind this? I mean, nobody said what kind of courses they teach. That they most of them will be teaching these up level classes or classes that. You see what I mean? And so that's the approach they have. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Right. So that's why I think that discussion is important. You know, that uh, it's not the same for all of us. It's not the same for you know that kind of you know faculty some faculty versus. And I'm not trying to say, okay, establishing conflict, just highlighting some of the issues there. I think that was in response to an article that was in the press this past fall. There was a study from Northwestern University um, that supposedly found that adjunct faculty members had higher um, evaluations of teaching than mm -hmm. full-time faculty members. So I think that that created some mm -hmm. anxiety. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say the exact same thing that Maria just said, so thank you, about the Middle States report and how um, I, I felt like it was misrepresentative in a lot of ways when it came to term faculty roles and performance. And um, you know, I don't know what can be done about that. I did send in a message, you know, pointing to the CAS report, mm -hmm. and um, uh, they have it. <laughs> uh, so you know, I, I just um, I, it concerns me when these kinds of perceptions are presented yeah. in a very formal report that yeah. goes beyond the university uh, and can raise all kinds of eyebrows with the um, you know various constituencies on campus and beyond. Uh, and the very kinds of things that Nuria pointed out, the idea of, um, you know, we teach larger courses, we have more students, uh, we are doing more preps, blah, 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 you know, there's a whole list of things we can come up with. Um, these all affect the sets, uh, and these um, evaluations are, you know, seem to be the only thing they were looking at in coming up with the content of that report. And the other thing that's been in the press a lot in the last six months or so is there's growing skepticism about the, the process of accreditation mm -hmm. and so much of our evaluation of teaching has been pushed through accreditation requirements and now we're seeing this backlash against accreditors and accreditation requirements and whether they're legitimate. So we really want to go in the direction of trying to adopt that the sort of language and thinking of learning objectives and learning outcomes mm -hmm. when it's of a, a, a live question. And I guess to add that, I would just add that, you know, students, you know, I'm very, and I'm sure a lot of people feel this way, and I know they do, but um, uh, very hesitant to really think about this that seriously because I, um, because students are uh, not accountable for their comments. And, you know, you always get somebody who hates you, right? Um, <laughs> sometimes maybe three people in a section of 40 who hate you for whatever reason you have no idea. 
uh, they think it's funny or something. I don't know, but uh, and that draws down your entire um, yeah. You know what I mean? Okay, so you know, I always thought if students had to sign these reports, or there's some sort of accountability, you know, who gets evaluated and whose contracts are are in any other profession, whose contracts are put forth uh, and debated with uh, such a uh, body of evidence that to, to which there is no accountability, right? So, you know, I, I mean, I wish we could eliminate these all together, but, um, you know, this is not going to happen, I guess. But, um, you know, is there some way that there can be more control over the, the way in which students are reporting this information and how it is then that, you know, we can have more confidence in the outcome of that information? There are, there are schools that do signatures. They're still anonymous. Mm. But they've found, there are studies that have shown that if students have to put their name on their SAT, even if nobody ever sees them, mm -hmm. they actually, the averages go up. Mm. Mm. It's really interesting. Yeah, there's been quite a bit of research in this in rhetoric and composition and research you focus. Well, we probably yeah. modify the behavior of the haters. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, right. There's a, that it creates accountability, even if it's never seen. And one of the things that was noted from the CTRL survey was that um, some units, probably a very small number, actually use student narrative comments as part of the evaluation process, which mm. I found very strange because yeah, you're those are only supposed to be private. To see that. So yeah. I don't know if that means narrative comments that are collected maybe you know through the pre and post test sort of thing, mm -hmm. or if there are other measures. Mm -hmm. I, just, I, mean, I, I think we're all really aware of limitations of SETs mm -hmm. and you could statistically try to say well you, they should be you know I had a, a colleague who, who created I'm an economist right so we did statistical analysis controlled for the, your, your average grades and, 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 and the class size and then created a, a new rating and then of course his, his ratings turned out to be great then. But, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway um, I, I think the point is I mean I think I think you're, I agree with you that they're, 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 they're uh, a necessary evil um, but what surprises me, having taught elsewhere, is that the is that you would expect that if we know that these are so limited, that we should be um, that there should be rather formalized other channels to evaluate. And I don't see how that happens in my own department. I don't think there's any standard university wide. I um, I was told for instance for FARS not to write any great detail about how I teach or anything. Mm -hmm. Just you know a few objective comments about I did this activity or that activity. And I, I expected to have some a chance to represent myself, you know, to sort of say, this is what I do. Mm -hmm. So that somebody who's evaluating me just has my voice there somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, the process is very non-transparent. I don't know if there's any interest at the university level. I think this affects all, mm -hmm. but all faculty, not particularly yeah. necessarily the term. But I think it would give us a lot more um, sort of security of feeling like at least our voice is being heard about what we think we're doing. And somebody has to respond to that because basically we have the student's voice and we have some totally untransparent decision making somewhere um, by our departments and perhaps by our deans and I don't, I don't see, it's a, to me it's a black box beyond, um, beyond the SET. I, I find that very interesting that you were given that. Who gave you that advice if you don't mind about not I mean, too much detail in your fire department. I mean, is that something oh, that's chairs and part of my, yeah. mm -hmm. I mean, I was told the same thing in my unit for the reason that, my unit's pretty small, and the rationale was, we already know what everyone's doing. You don't need to put that much detail. I thought, you don't know what I'm doing. Like, okay, maybe, maybe the tenure line faculty know who's published this article and who's published this book, but you don't know all the work that I've put into prepping new courses and all the innovative pedagogy I'm working on. Just a couple of mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, just a couple of points. Um, it, 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 talking about like, to help you know, campus-wide term faculty, a one pager or two pager of best practices. So for example, what Kogut's doing. That I could go to my dean and say, this is what they're doing, and we should be doing this also. But I think there's a, a, a challenge of communication, um, which I think for the committee would be you know, something. Yeah, that that's a role that our committee could. Another thing that, that Lisa and I were involved with, and Phil is an advocate of this, is and the reappointment. It's crazy how it's with these notebooks, and it's all paper, and it's not electronic. And it, and it comes back to the sets discussion. But the, we really sort of advocate that this process of reappointment be streamlined and Make easier for us to do, but also easier to sort of get this data 
uh, whatever the different points are, um, I, I just think that that's something that we that we could advocate, and the sets sort of fit into that. Then a, a, a final two points is, you know, all on the portal, all the sets are made available to people who can get into the portal, but there's no way of sort of analyzing that to say, okay, it specs the average is this on this. Mm -hmm. It's just everybody's got their own sort of their own sort of line. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's intentional or if it's a technology thing. I don't know if it's something that we would want to advocate because I can see pros and cons on both, but it, it's something that should definitely be given some thought. And then the final thing is there was just a leadership re re retreat where one of the issues that the provost is concerned about is great inflation. And when we're talking about business and economics, we're talking about you know patent incentives. So how, where, does the, where do the sets fit in as far as, and probably you already made this point kind of, where, you know, if, if great inflation is a problem and the university wants to deal with it, how does that fit in with the sets? <laughs> That's a good point, Jeff. Um, okay, just a question for Bob. So I had also briefly in passing mentioned COGOT processing to a colleague of mine, and she said something about how COGOT is able to do that because you have a different funding stream than the rest of the university. A different? Funding stream? Oh, we do. Could you explain that? Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's actually, I think, a totally crappy deal for Kogat, and we are being screwed royally, but that's another subject. The way our, um, we are treated as an, in quotes, kind of profit center. 50% of all of our tuition revenue goes to the university. 100% of all of our expenses stay with us. And we're expected to be profitable on that basis. Now, you know, Bob Kogod has been good enough a couple of years running to write a check for the variation, but that's fundamentally how how Kogod works, and I think we're the only school that works that way. So my colleague was making the link that because of this process, you're able to be so transparent, you're able to have different university-wide I don't know why that would link to transparency. I mean, we do have, we create our own, within our budget, we create our own salary increase level. It's not a big number, but that develops the pot from which everybody draws. But the transparency of the process, the evaluation, et cetera, that's really not linked to to our being a standalone profit center. I'm sorry. I was just saying maybe it, because you can um, create your own variable. Yeah, we do create our own miracle. But that that basically says how big a number people are going to get. But again, even that miracle, everybody draws, whether you're a full professor or a brand new first year term faculty, you all draw, draw from the same pool and you're all held against similar criteria, though for example, tenure line would be 40, 40, 20. 40 teaching, 40 research, 20 service, which curiously, uh, that says for every course they teach, they get 10% of their time and work. Since mine is 75% and I teach six, that's 12.5%. Yeah. Now, I don't ever raise that to anybody as to why I get more credit for teaching a course than tenured faculty, but I do. And, and, and my sense, um, Corinne, is, is that this is a policy, like, like these policies are set at the unit level, regardless of budget, I mean, regardless of funding. Uh, stream because I know that that in 2010 the SIS Faculty Council passed a measure to have all of this process put in writing, you know, for in plain view for everybody. This is how you were evaluated, and for a year or two we got letters with that kind of information, and then with the in, with the in, with the new regime that's gone now. So we don't know we, we don't know. So even though we the rest of the faculty still thinks that this measure is is in effect. Um, it's, not. it's not. Wow, what a step backwards. Huh? Yeah, yeah. I'm shocked. But just to build on these points and kind of going beyond the SATs, uh, uh, some term faculty do research and, you know, the appeal mm. of media and things of that sort. Yeah. And for whatever reason, just think that there's very little attention. It's not and for whatever reason, because it's pieces. not part of your evaluation package. That's yeah, yeah, 20, I 75, 25. <laughs> You're an, you're an SIS Mohammed, right? It, there, there is a, a, like all of the units have to have some kind of language stating like 
this is how you're, you pr get promoted, and this is how you get evaluated. And, and so for us, it's teaching, first and foremost, like everybody else, Meaningful service, they call it meaningful, but don't really give any, any definition of what meaningful is. And nothing about scholarship. Now, if you, if you do scholarship, this will matter if you are up for promotion for um, um, associate professor, right? I'm imagining right now you're somewhere in the lecture professional yeah. lecture track. Yeah, so, so right now, this, this has no bearing on your promotional uh, prospects. Up until that, up until that time, this is terrible. Well, that's a different track, though. Mm -hmm. What's that? That's a different track. Yeah. The professorial yeah. lecture, yeah. 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 yeah see, it's, it's, I mean, I, I, I perfectly understand this part, but mm -hmm. see, when you're in the media, like I appear in everything, in the media, like, and you know, there's there's the name of SS. Yeah. And then I, I do too, out, but that goes right. on my bars. Mm -hmm. I make sure yeah. that's on my bars every time I'm on TV. But it's not worth it. So it, 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 it doesn't it doesn't matter. <laughs> well, it matters. It matters in Kogan. And and when I'm on T V it goes the, to the, the, the repeated the repeated statements of of program directors at SIS is that it doesn't matter. But does it matter in the way Lacey mentioned earlier, which is the contract renewal? No. No? Not at SIS. Really? Um, wow. Just to give your committee more work, um, two suggestions of things you could maybe advocate for. No. Um, I think we're about done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> two things I think that would be useful, and I'm thinking of actually support of the Senate committee that's going to be working on this. Um, one is to advocate for increased use of files for action for term faculty. Um, I know in college writing we actually have Lincoln portfolios, but they're quite significant files for action in which we submit teaching materials, cover mm -hmm. memos, yeah. you know, a variety of things. Mm -hmm. I think most units don't do that. To we me, it's that. appalling that yeah. people are reappointed based right. on yeah. bars. Yeah. That's insane. I thought files for action was required. Sorry. Yeah, we have file for action. What's oh, in it? Yeah. So, oh, so, 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 all kinds of stuff. Yeah, no, so no, but we do our own. I mean, I'm saying we, we put together our own files. Yeah. We put our materials in it. That's inconsistent across the university, oh, I and I think that should be, I think it should be consistently done across the university. Um, then you have to, then that sort of requires a response, you know, in a way. Um, and I have a second point, but, um, but I, oh, I know what it was. The other thing I need to advocate for that would, again, help the Senate side is we have good guidelines in place for promotion now. I think, I think those are very strong, they're very transparent, they're up on the DAA's website. We don't have good guidelines for reappointment. We don't have equivalent guidelines for reappointment. Those aren't the same thing. Promotion and reappointment should not be the same thing. Somebody who's a first year term faculty member, their standards for reappointment should not be the same as somebody going up for senior professorial lecturer. Right. Um, we need separate sets of guidelines for each unit that are published, that are visible, um, and every unit across the university should have them. Um, that, I think, one reason there's no transparency is because people don't know what to say because there are no guidelines that give them the language of what to say. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the, the advocacy committee could certainly do a lot towards pushing from that end. You can't tell people to be more transparent. Well, you can, but they don't have to. But if you give them stuff, then I think the odds go up that they will. And Lacey, just to be clear, uh -huh. there is a requirement for units to state their guidelines for promotion but not for reappointment. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Okay. Right. Yeah, no, they don't, I, as far as I know, they don't exist and they certainly yeah. don't exist on the DAA's website. I don't think there's a requirement for promotion either. I think it's been taken up as a practice, but I don't think it's taken in our Well, they were all, all units were required to do them. Yeah. And if they did, at least in CAS, they didn't do them, Peter gave them to them. Yeah. I think part of that yeah. contract renewal issue is because all, all of us here are based on need. So if for some reason there there isn't a need, that then is we're, we're, that's actually not true. Um, if you're on cash lines, you're on a need basis. The cash line is the line gets renewed every year. Mm -hmm. If you're on a baseline, your line is permanent. Mm -hmm. Oh, I never um, heard of that one. Yes, and that's very and that's another. That's a whole different issue is getting people on more baselines instead of cash. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's interesting. I never heard that one. That's something I'd like to. I'd like to learn more about that. I like to. I like to learn cash line, but 
Well, I guess you want to be baseline. Right? All right. So, so yeah. wait, one, one more point. We're, 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 we're starting to run out of time. So, but so yeah, because we're out of time. Yeah. The, the, the session was happening beyond the set. I assume that we would have ideas that maybe can be advocated of what are the other instruments beyond the set. I know Evan said one of get the voice of the instructor mm. in there with the course. I just wonder if we can at some point uh, let us do the task force yeah. plural uh, get listing of things uh, that other instruments that could be used beside the set because at the end of the day this is the only thing they have. It's a blunt instrument but it's the only thing they have and all the complaining we do still fall yeah, back. Change. Yeah. Yeah. Ho yeah. Hopefully that will be one of the products of the Senate Committee will be a list of things to use. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, mean, I, I think that's really important for us to produce that. Yeah. And I think what we've heard here is that there are a number of areas that we could be paying more attention to, like the m number of preps, the number of students, yeah. you know, like, like all these different factors, um, gen eds versus non-gen eds, um, that, that would have some kind of bearing on the performance of the instructor, regardless of what they've done in the classroom. Right, but you can't measure that. Exactly. So yeah. we've got to find a way to develop a tool <laughs> that captures that. Good, yeah. Last word. Two things. <laughs> you think baseline is good, but remember that line is secure, but you in it isn't. Right. Mm. right. Yes. So, uh, okay. so keep that in mind. Yes, because it's not taken. <laughs> oh, insecurity is felt everywhere. Don't worry. So keep that in mind. Also, the second thing, I think we have um, our title for uh, next year's Ann Perrin, which will be five. Six, sixteen plus. Oh well. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.